I'm, I'm really feel privileged and moved to introduce Uzrama. Um, she's been so influential in um, many, many ways. Um, she is an independent scholar. She was trained as a goldsmith, and she is now a handloom activist and many other things. <laughs> um, Uzrama has uh, been associated with indigenous cotton textile industry since 1989, and you'll hear much more about that. Uh, she founded the um, Dastkar Andhra, um, Malka, and now holds the position of director in of both the Decentralized Cotton Yarn Trust, which you'll hear some more about, and also the Malka Marketing Trust. Dastkar Andhra, which um, Annapurna also worked in, um, was very active in cotton handloom weaver cooperatives, and they have trained artisan groups all over India and in Central Asian countries in the techniques of natural dyeing. So um, please help me welcome, we'll hear much more about these in initiatives um, as Uzrama speaks, um, but please help me welcome um, Uzrama uh, today. Well, thank you very much, Pamela, for inviting me to this quite extraordinary conference. Um, and uh, uh, I just want to start by saying that it's a new experience for me because I'm really not in the academic world at all. As Anapurna says, uh, today in the 21st century, there are over 4 million handlooms weaving cloth in India. That's almost as many people as the entire population of Ireland. This vast assemblage with its supporting caste allows me to suggest that here is a possibility of a large-scale, democratic, producer-owned ecological industry, such that would pioneer democracy in production in one of the world's largest economies. And so the apparently unconnected words of my title, the Indian loom, climate change, and democracy, sum up my belief that contemporary Indian hand weaving can, in the Anthropocene age, be a vehicle for a journey towards both environmental and social health. I put forward this thesis for consideration as the fruit of my 27 years in the hand weaving of cotton cloth in India, particularly of my current involvement, the Malka Enterprise. I hope that this conference will initiate a wider conversation around this theme and that you too can share the Malka dream. The event that towered over my childhood in the 1940s, a long time ago, and shaped the consciousness of my generation of Indians was the movement for independence from colonial rule. Gandhi made the hand spinning of cotton yarn a political tool in that movement, and both men and women spun yarn by hand and wore handwoven cotton cloth as an expression of defiance of colonialism and an assertion of Indian identity. Gandhi's journal, Young India, which appeared weekly between 1919 and 1931, often carried articles on the destruction of the Indian cotton textile industry in colonial times. Hand weaving of cotton cloth thus acquired a political resonance, a resonance that continues to ebb and flow today. Meanwhile, the practice of hand weaving holds its own into the 21st century. As Annapurna says, it is the largest employer in rural India after agriculture. And according to the Textile Ministry's report, last year produced 7,356 million square meters of cloth, between 12 and 15% of the country's textile output. Weaving on the handloom in India is a vast and vibrant activity practiced by hand weavers supported by warp makers, warp sizers, bobbin winders, dyers, and tool makers, producing these vast quantities of cloth every year without using fossil fuels, and so without adding to global warming. This is what makes the handloom industry of India a tiger of ecological manufacture. 
Alas, this tiger is shut up in an iron cage of prejudice that perceives artisan industries as aberrations in an industrializing economy, non-conformists to the imperative of productivity. This perception allows the Indian state to neglect to enforce its own law, the Handloom Reservation Act of 1985, by which some products are the exclusive prerogative of the handloom industry. The consequence of ignoring this law is that cheaper, machine-made, fake handloom cloth made on unregulated unreg mechanized looms known in India as power looms, this cloth is allowed to undercut the real thing in the market. So hand weaving wages decline and young weavers look for alternatives, like Pradeep, a young weaver from the Indian state of Orissa. Here's his story. I left for Surat, he says. Surat is a power loom center about a thousand miles from Pradeep's home. I left for Surat to work in the power looms there with big dreams of becoming wealthy and an important person in society. I finally found work in a power loom factory where I had to work from seven in the morning for at least 12 hours a day for a wage of 75 rupees per day. That's about a fifth of the legal minimum wage in India for eight hours of work. The owner of the factory treated us badly and it was common to suffer verbal abuse. We were actually treated like slaves and had to literally beg for our salaries at the end of the month. We were, if any worker raised questions or pointed out the management's faults, he was immediately dismissed. I don't want to talk about the dreadful living conditions in Surat. There were no basic amenities like safe drinking water and toilets. We lived just like animals in a barn. My dreams of becoming successful faded. It was in the exploitation of Surat that I realized that my traditional handloom was a much more dignified occupation. And I came back to my village. After I returned, I noticed that more than 100 people from our village had returned from Surat to their traditional handlooms. Now I lead a happier and healthier life at home. I hope more weavers get the opportunity to be able to make a dignified look, living on the basis of their skills and knowledge and I'm sure handloom can be a successful occupation for all weavers in the future. Pradeep was fortunate that a not-for-profit agency intervened, and after his return, he was able to enjoy the value his skill deserves. A dignified living is how Pradeep sees hand weaving. Now that environmental collapse threatens life on the planet, this cage of prejudice against artisanal cloth making must open and let the tiger out. The handlooms of India must be allowed to reach their potential as a sustainable way of production for the future and not dismissed as relics of the past. Viability should no longer be measured by productivity alone. Ecological as well as social costs, the pollution and greenhouse gas emissions of fossil fueled industry and the exploitation of power loom workers like Pradeep must be factored into the equation. Established conventions must be questioned. Is the mechanization of all manufacture the only route to modernity? Is the industrial model that was established by the Industrial Revolution the one size fits all way to progress for the whole world? And so, does that make India a late modernizer, playing the catch up game and never quite catching up? Or is it possible for India to chart its own path and take a shortcut into a post-industrial future? Is the mechanization of cotton cloth weaving in India necessary or desirable or even viable, considering that that industry today, the mechanized weaving of cloth, is today propped up by financial debt? And is the handloom really a thing of the past? The handloom allows millions of Indian weavers to use kinetic human energy for production. And with its low cost infrastructure, it contains the emergent possibility of democratic ownership of the means of production, two unassailable arguments for future sustainability. The Malkha project of which I am a part aims to promote hand weaving of cotton as an industry for the future and to introduce ownership of the means of production and workplace democracy 
in the contemporary Indian artisanal cotton textile industry. It's an ideal that keeps the Malkha group going during the practical day-to-day -day routine that such engagement demands. I've been involved with this industry, as I said, for many years. I don't myself weave, I'm a goldsmith actually, but I've worked with weaving families as part of supporting agencies. And it was during the early days of that involvement that the potential of the Indian loom became apparent to me. The Malkha idea had its birth pangs in Chinnur, a small town in Telangana state of India, where in the surrounding villages, the sound of shuttles on wooden looms can still be heard. I was one of a small group who had been invited to Chinnur by the local weavers in the 1990s. And with this invitation, we stumbled on perhaps the last remaining living memories of subsistence weaving, local weaving for local use. People in Chinnur and the villages around were at the time still using the cloth that had been made 25 years earlier by their weaver neighbors. It was perhaps the only place in the country where a generation of hand weavers was still active who remembered buying their own yarn and selling their own cloth locally. But by the time we reached Chinnur, things had changed and local markets had been invaded by cloth made on distant machines. The Chinnur weavers thought that if they could buy their own yarn, they could still beat the competition. We helped them set up a cooperative and get loans from the local bank. We outsiders knew nothing of handloom weaving. The weavers, on the other hand, had no experience of business, but they were confident that they'd be able to sell their cloth in their own neighborhood, as they'd been used to. They were wrong. The direct relation between maker and user had been broken forever. For hand weaving to survive, the Chinnur weavers had to look to urban markets. The looms came to life, but the cloth piled up and the co-op faced ruin. But collective determination held, the looms would go on. We persuaded a natural dye expert to come to Chinnur and teach the weavers vegetable dyeing, and we sold their natural dyed fabrics in big cities. Here in Chinnur, the difference between the making of ordinary cloth for ordinary people, which is what the Chinnur weavers used to do, and the making of fine fabrics for the elite, that difference became clear to me for the first time. Relations of production in the two are very different. Weavers making ordinary cloth for ordinary people in what I call vernacular weaving had bought their own raw materials and sold directly to the users. Making cloth for the elite, on the other hand, needed substantial investments in raw materials, finer yarns and metal threads for embellishment, for which weavers became dependent on an intermediary who financed the business, supplied the raw materials, and also controlled market access, with the weaver reduced to the status of wage labor, in what I think of as the patronage mode. Democracy, on the one hand, and hierarchy on the other. We began to look closer into the archival history of Indian textiles to find historical precedents for the democracy in production that Malkha was aiming for in contemporary times. But except for a hint here and there, we didn't find it. Though the trade in Indian textiles attracts a lot of scholarly interest, there is precious little attention paid to its actual manufacture. History books lump all the pre-industrial textile making of India into one, without seeing that they were actually two very different modes of production. The archives say that from the time of Christ for the next 18 centuries, this industry clothed the world and was the world's largest manufacturing industry for all that time and that Indian cotton cloth was the largest manufactured item in world trade. But the historical record, at least in the English language, seems to have overlooked the important difference between subsistence or vernacular cotton cloth making and the patronage mode, the two very different production systems of this tiger of the pre-industrial era. Ordinary thick Indian cotton cloth has been found in Berenike and Fostat in Egypt, carbon dated from the 5th to the 14th centuries a trade of over 900 years, surely a fit subject for long durée studies. 
It was the resilience of the democratic production relations within the vernacular part of the industry that interested us. What had kept it going for 1,800 years through wars, famines, plagues, and natural disasters, adapting to changing political situations, making cloth for nearby customers, and reaching markets as far as Egypt until it was decimated by the colonial powers in the 19th century. But while this aspect of pre-industrial Indian cloth production systems has been neglected by historians, the history of early mechanization of cotton textile making in England is found in every school history book. School children across the world know of Hargreaves and his spinning jenny. Somewhere in this view of history, the future potential of vernacular production is lost. Historians across the political spectrum regard the mechanization of the cotton textile industry as progress, and the decline and fall of Indian hand weaving as inevitable, almost like a process of nature. The corollary to that view is that pre-industrial technologies were static and stagnant, and that view is the source of today's perception of the handloom in contemporary times as an outmoded tool for cloth making. A prejudice that then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, affecting the self-worth of young weavers like Pradeep. I have two quarrels with this textile history. First, that it has so often and so loudly insisted on the inevitability of the fossil-fueled mechanization pioneered by the Industrial Revolution, that it has blocked any possible exploration of alternatives. This narrative is a Eurocentric history. But in the 20th century, critical studies paint a different picture. They show that the decline of the Indian textile industry was not at all natural or inevitable. It was, in fact, engineered by unscrupulous means and the unrestrained use of force. Through a combination of the political and commercial might of the empire to break the back of the millennia-old industry. The colonial rulers took away the cotton from Indian looms for the mills of England. They flooded Indian markets with subsidized yarn and cloth, and they loaded Indian manufacture with taxes. Here is what Francis Karnak Brown, a British cotton planter in India in the 19th century, here is what he has to say in 1862 about the taxes. The story of cotton in India is not half told, he writes, how it was systematically depressed from the earliest date that American cotton came into competition with it, about the year 1786, how for, 50 or how for 40 or 50 years after, one half of the crop was taken in kind as revenue, the other half by the sovereign merchant at a price much below the market price of the day which itself was habitually kept down for the purpose. How the cotton farmers plow and bullocks were taxed, the charkha, that's the spinning wheel, uh, taxed, the bow taxed, and the loom taxed. How inland customs houses were posted in and around every village, on passing which cotton on its way to the coast was topped, and like every other produce, taxed afresh. How it paid export duty both in a raw state and in every shape of yarn, of thread, or uh, cloth, or handkerchief, in which it was possible to manufacture it. How the dyer was taxed, and the dyed cloth taxed. Plain in the loom, taxed a second time in the dye vats. How Indian peace goods were loaded in England with a prohibitory duty, and English peace goods were imported into India at an ad valorem duty of 2.5%. It is my firm conviction, Francis Karnak Brown goes on to say, that the same treatment would long since have converted any of the finest countries in Europe into wilderness. But the sun has continued to give forth to India its vast, vivifying rays, the heavens to pour down upon the vast surface its tropical rains. These perennial gifts of the universal father, it has not been possible to tax. My second objection to this narrative is that it ignores the devastating effect of the Industrial Revolution on the working population of India. 
the millions of hands that had clothed the world for the preceding millennia. In fact, even today, apologists for colonialism claim that colonial India experienced positive economic growth. It's because subsistence production does not figure in the historical narrative that such claims can be made. Peeling the layers off the story and going deeper into the subsistence part, one gets a truer and grimmer picture. In this part, that had supplied clothing for the working population of India, cotton yarn before the intrusion of machine spinning had been spun by hand from cotton bought from local farmers. Exchange had been either at the spinner's doorstep or at the weekly local market. These markets, by the way, had a crucial role to play in the production chain, and more about them in a few minutes. With the invention of spinning machinery, all this changed. Yarn began to be supplied to Indian markets from English factories at highly subsidized rates, and the millions of Indian spinners lost their only way of earning a living. It was deindustrialization on a major scale. A letter written in 1828 to the editor of a Bengali newspaper paints a graphic picture of the distress this caused. To the editor, the Samachar, the letter says, I am a spinner. After having suffered a great deal, I am writing this letter. Please publish this in your paper. I have heard that if it is published, it will reach those who may lighten my distress and fulfill my desire. When my age was 22, I became a widow with three daughters. My husband left nothing at the time of his death wherewith to support my old father and mother-in-law and three daughters. I sold my jewelry for his funeral ceremony. At last, as we were on the verge of starvation, God showed me a way by which we could save ourselves. I began to spin on takli and charkha. Takli is the drop spindle. Thus, I used to spin about a tola. The weavers used to visit our houses and buy the yarn at three tolas per rupee. Whatever amount I wanted as advance from the weavers, I could get for the asking. This saved us from cares about food and cloth. In a few years' time, I got together 28 rupees. With this, I married one daughter, and in the same way, all three daughters. Now, for three years, we two women, my mother-in-law and I, are in want of food. The weavers do not call at the house to buy yarn. Not only this, if the yarn is sent to the market, it is not sold even at one-fourth the old price. I do not know how it happened. I asked many about it. They say that bilaiti yarn is being largely imported. Bilaiti means foreign in Hindustani. The weavers use that yarn to weave. I had a sense of pride that bilaiti yarn could not be equal to my yarn. But when I saw bilaiti yarn, I saw that it was better than my own yarn. I heard that its price is three or four rupees per seer. That's about one-eighth of the price that she used to sell her yarn for. I beat my brow and said, oh God, there are sisters more distressed even than I. I had thought that all men of Bilat were rich, but now I see that there are women there who are poorer than I. I fully realized the poverty which induced those poor women to spin. They have sent the product of so much toil out here because they could not sell it there. It would have been something if they were sold here at good prices, but it has brought our ruin only. Men cannot use the cloth out of this yarn even for two months, it rots away. I therefore entreat the spinners over there that if they will consider this representation, they will be able to judge whether it is fair to send yarn here or not. Besides taking spinning out of the hands of local spinners by selling heavily subsidized English machine-made yarn in Indian markets, machine spinning had other consequences on the kinds of cloth that were woven, on cotton farmers, and of course, on production relations in the field to fabric chain. Indian cloth had been famed for its diversity. 
until mill spinning came into the picture, the farmer grew the cotton that was best suited to the local microclimate and the local soil, from which spinners spun the yarn that the weavers wanted for the particular cloth that they wove. Most production cycles from the cotton to the cloth were local, but there were exceptions. Some fine cloth was woven from yarns spun a great distance away. For example, yarn spun in Berar is said to have been bought for its weight in silver in Chanderi, 400 miles to the north, as John Forbes Watson notes in his Textile Manufactures and Costumes of the People of India, published in 1866, which, by the way, was a handbook to help English manufacturers copy Indian textiles to be sold in Indian markets. The different soils of the subcontinent grew an array of different cottons, which weavers wove into a variety of textiles. Hobson Jobson, the Anglo-Indian Dictionary of 1886, lists a hundred different kinds of Indian cloth. Albeli, Alroks, Kosai, Baftas, Bejutas, Koras, Dorias, Dot, Sutis, Cheats, Ginghams, Jamdanis, Moris, Malmals, Mushrooms, Nansuks, Nilai, Palampur, Punjam, Susi, and so on and so on. With the mechanization of spinning, this diversity was diluted. The spinning machinery was the same everywhere and demanded one uniform kind of cotton and produced one uniform kind of yarn. Once machine spinning replaced hand spinning, the weaver was forced to weave only the kind of yarn that the machines produced, and the farmer was forced to grow only the kind of cotton the machines could use. And so the criteria to judge the quality of cotton changed. From now on, the best cotton was considered to be the one suited to machine spinning, not the cotton that made the best cloth. For example, the cotton variety that was used to weave the famed Dhaka muslins, the finest cloth the world had ever seen, was now considered inferior because its staples were relatively short and soft, too short and too soft for the machine. And finally, mechanization broke the social bonds between farmer, spinner, and weaver. Spinning machinery worked on an industrial scale that did not match the small scale of hand weaving or cotton farming. The large scale of the spinning mill gave it an overwhelming hegemonic power over both. It was a fundamental change that introduced hierarchy into a formerly democratic production chain. That democracy and those lateral relationships is what Malka eventually hopes to reestablish. Our discovery in the archives of democratic production in the subsistence mode of production was mirrored by the real life experience of the weaving families of Chinnur. The memories of the Chinnur elders made an unbroken link between past and present, between the archives and the practice of a subsistence industry. As we watched the cloth taking shape on the looms of Chinnur, the matriarchs of the weaver community told us stories of how things used to be. It was their stories that brought to life for us the history of subsistence weaving in India and showed us a path to a possible future. The old people told us that English yarn had replaced local spinning 100 years earlier, snapping the bonds between local spinning and weaving. Then the yarn from England stopped coming during the Second World War when the sea route to India became unsafe for English shipping. And with that, the virtuous cycle of local production in Chinnur for local use was finally broken. Eureka. The way yarn was made was the link that connected farmer to weaver, the stage that could make or break the democratic circle of cotton to cloth today. Here was the clue that we were looking for, the signpost to a complete producer-owned cotton textile production chain for the future. The spinning technology invented in England during the Industrial Revolution had served the interests of the investor owners of the technology and the interests of cotton farmers, machine operators, and weavers of the yarn had to be sacrificed to it. <coughs> remember the Luddites, remember the protests of the Luddites. 
At their cost, spinning had to be made profitable for machine owners. That was the rationale for the spinning technology, and that is the same technology that continues to be used today. Modernization just makes the machines run faster to increase productivity, again, serving the interests of the owners of the machines. If, on the other hand, a democratic cotton textile production chain is what we want, the nature of yarn spinning has to change. This is the basis for the Malka project. In Chinnur, we went from theory to practice, from the library to the looms and dye vats, driven by the compulsion of keeping the wheels of production turning, but at the same time wanting to dig deeper into the archive to know why things were the way they were. Each story that we heard filled a gap in the jigsaw of textile history. In a village near Chinnur, we met Durgam Pocham, an elder of the Dher community, who are known in the Chinnur area as Netagani, non-weavers. Though they now worked as farm labor, Pocham remembered their cloth-making days when they ginned and carded the cotton themselves and wove the cloth too. He showed us his old carding bow made of cow gut and a local wood. And out of friendship, he brought down his old yarn-making tools and loom from the rafters of his house and wove a length of cloth for us. Durgam Pocham's story was a living link to Rivet Karnak's report on the cotton department for the year 1867. On pages 18 and 19 of this report is a list of stalls in a weekly market in a cotton growing area in what Rivet Karnak calls the otherwise insignificant village of Jamurgata. The first riveting thing in the report, sorry about that, is the sheer scale of it. There are 1,424 stalls selling everything from grain and leather and vegetables to axes and plowshares. There are on average 8,000 buyers who visit this little weekly market. There are 250 head of cattle, there are goldsmiths and sil silversmiths and sellers of perfume. Raw cotton and yarn are there, but the largest number of stalls, 521, sell cloth. And of those, outnumbering the fine cloth sellers by far, are 350 dhers, selling cloth of their own manufacture. And this, Rivet Karnak says, is but one of the many places to which the peasantry flock for the cloth made by the dhers. So, according to this account at least, Jamur Ghutta is one of many weekly markets that serve a network of small-scale, decentralized, dispersed, and varied production stretching across the Indian continent. Between the lines of the Rivet Karnak report is the hidden story of the large scale of subsistence of vernacular Indian production and trade in the cloth that was woven by Durgam Pocham's Dher non-weaving community. The markets of the time are enabling spaces, meeting places for weavers, spinners, farmers, and buyers to meet on equal terms, democratic spaces. The nature of markets has changed radically since then, from small, friendly, dispersed local spaces where producers meet buyers as equals. These have now been replaced by a single entity, the market, a dominant entity that demands large quantities of uniform products, a demand that is unsuited to small-scale production. It is particularly a mismatch with Indian hand weaving, which by its nature is a small-scale activity, but one that still provides a livelihood to several millions. Meanwhile, cotton farming in India today is a tragic tale. Cotton is still grown by smallholder farmers on holdings of two to five acres each, who last year produced 35 million bales of 170 kilos each. That's 13 billion, 90 million pounds of cotton lint, making India the largest cotton grower in the world. Farmers must now grow a single variety of cotton, the single variety that the machines demand. This one is expensive to grow, and the expense is entirely the responsibility of the farmer. 
but the Indian climate is notoriously fickle, and often there is too much or too little rain, and that risk too is the farmers, who often is unable to bear it. The largest wave of suicides in history, according to P. Sainath, a chronicler of rural India, the largest wave of suicides in history is happening in Indian fields, and many of those suicides are among the farmers of cotton. Both small-scale hand weaving and smallholder cotton farming are dependent on large spinning mills, which run on large commercial scales. But the Indian state ignores the asymmetry of that relation. And to quote the white knight in Alice in Wonderland, madly tries to squeeze a right-hand foot into a left-hand shoe by leaving small farmers and hand weavers to deal with the dominating scale of both markets on the one hand and spinning mills on the other. Now for the Malka initiative. There is no end to its ambition. Malka hopes to address all the issues that have been bequeathed to the Indian cotton textile industry in colonial times. Malka charts a different path for cotton yarn spinning towards a smaller scale to come closer to the scale of cotton growing and hand weaving. The three spinning units that Malka runs today have 100 times fewer spindles than commercial mills, 400 as compared to 40,000. And they produce 100 times less yarn, 40 kilos per eight hour shift, enough for 40 hand weavers. Malka runs the machine for eight hours a day, six days a week, with days off for festivals and holidays, with sick leave and 15 days of paid holiday and a bonus every year for the operators, with the eventual aim of handing over a running concern to a cooperative of producers. In commercial mills, on the other hand, the machines are run to make a profit for the owners, so they never stop. They're run for three shifts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Malka would like to tame that frightening animal, the market, and return to the producer some of the autonomy she once had. In historical times, weavers were notoriously independent-minded, and entire populations of weavers were known to pick up their looms and vanish overnight if rulers imposed unjust taxes or took away their privileges. Today, the market is powerful enough to dictate terms. Cheapness is all, and pollution and the exploitation of labor underpin the low prices which the market demands. This is the market in which Malka has to compete, a market that does not reward ecological manufacture and does not value democracy. Diversity is a disadvantage in this market. The variations of small batch production, of hand weaving, hand block printing, and natural dyeing are seen as defects, and markets prefer the boring sameness of mass production. But will conventional mass production industry suit Indian circumstances? The industrial situation in India today is that conventional capital-intensive industries employ only 7% of the country's working population. And within that, the rights of labor are steadily being eroded with increasingly unfair labor practices. And the World Bank warns that 69% of even those few jobs is threatened by automation. Inequality in India is stratospheric. India is like islands of California in a sea of sub-Saharan Africa, as Jean Drez and Amartya Sen put it. The richest 1% of Indians owns nearly 60% of the country's wealth, up from 50% only two years ago and still rising. Meanwhile, malnutrition, particularly in the countryside, is worsening as jobs dry up, real wages fall, and food prices rise. But it is not an inevitable trajectory. India's historical strengths of hand weaving and natural dyeing and the diversity of its indigenous cotton varieties can be powerful tools to build an alternative, large-scale, ecological textile production system 
that employs large numbers without ghettoization and which can be steered into becoming a democratic production system in the hands of its producers. That is Malka's dream. We who run Malka are a small group of people committed to the ideal of democracy in production. We want the spinners and weavers of Malka eventually to own and manage the spinning machines and handlooms which they operate. Until that can happen, we manage the three small-scale units with two more coming up that spin the Malka yarn. We manage the handlooms that weave the Malka fabric. We manage the inventory and the marketing. We have big dreams, but the daily reality for Malka consists of hard slog at banal tasks. And believe me, it's a struggle. We have doubts and fears. There's no roadmap to follow. We take wrong turns and make misjudgments that take enormous amounts of resources and energy to correct. And all the time, we must keep the spinning machines and looms running and our heads above water in the market. We have a long way to go, and we're still far from reaching the goal. But we persist, reaching for the stars with our feet in the mud. Thank you. Thank you very much, Usrama. We'll have time. I'm sure you all have lots of questions. We'll have time for questions after um, a response from Professor Maury Cohen, who is a professor of sustainability studies and director of the program in science, technology, and society at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He has um, he uh, is the editor of Sustainability, Science, Practice, and Policy, and he's co-founder and executive board member of the Sustainable Consumption Research and Action Initiative. Um, he also has worked on the network on systems of sustainable consumption and production. And I'm very happy to welcome him here to, um, to comment on this inspiring lecture from Usrama. Well, thanks to Pam and to the organizers. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and. Uh, a great honor to be able to comment on this, this fascinating and insightful paper. Um, I'm sure you all have many, many questions, so let me try to be, um, be as brief as I, as I can um, in order to give you a chance to, um, to jump in on your own. Um, so I received a copy of this paper probably three or four weeks ago, um, and uh, it's given me as I discussed with Uzrama earlier this morning. Um, it's given me a great excuse to uh, pursue some fascinating lines of conversation with some of my South Asian colleagues around the world. Um, and uh, it's been a focus of uh, discussion in uh, my travels over the last couple of weeks. So I found myself in Kyoto, Japan a couple of weeks ago, where I um, accidentally ran into a couple of Indian colleagues and uh, we discussed this um, this paper, uh, I drew on their insights and uh, and much greater expert knowledge of uh, of, um, of Indian political economy and uh, the weaving industry than I certainly had at my disposal. Um, I was in uh, the southern part of New Jersey yesterday, where I also ran into another um, uh, Indian colleague, and we um, we had a chance to discuss it. Um, but let me sort of return back to that uh, in a in a little bit later at my. Um, in my comments. So um, the first acknowledgement is that uh, what I know about weaving and textiles, you could probably fit into a thimble. Um, I spent time a couple of decades ago involved in a project not too far from here, about five or six miles um, in, uh, in the borough of Queens, which uh, unknown to many people is a, a neighborhood um, which at the time had about 400 small-scale knitwear manufacturers um, that uh, before production shifted much more comprehensively and systematically to, um, to East, East Asia, um, played a very important niche, or sat in a very important niche in the New York garment manufacturing um, industry. Uh, and I was involved in a project of trying to implement a an Italian um, industrial networking model 
uh, amongst this community of, um, of knitwear manufacturers. Um, more recently, I was involved in a, in a project with a, an Afghan uh, PhD student based in Canada uh, that was funded by the Central Asian University in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. So it's an interesting kind of global project. Um, and um, and uh, so this project was focused on, um, on some strategies to uplift the social and economic circumstances of, of carpet weavers in Bamyan province. Um, but I think probably the sort of a more um, relevant and maybe a more important point of departure is, uh, is a recent book that I've uh, just published um, called The Future of Consumer Society, Prospects for Sustainability in the New Economy. The book has a chapter that we, we heard a little bit about it in the earlier presentation um, this morning um, on making, or what has come to be referred in the United States, North America, sort of across the, the, the realm of, uh, of, of, um, of, of so-called developed countries, um, the maker movement and the growing appreciation, fascination, engagement of people in craft production of a variety of different kinds. Um, and uh, this book, and partly a separate book that's recently come out that I've had a hand in producing, um, sort of opens up some ground about the sort of general notion of what we might think of as post-consumerism. Um, and, uh, and this work charts the, the fact that the, the underlying pillars that have supported and maintained um, consumerist lifestyles in the United States and beyond um, are beginning to erode and give way to something else. And the um, sort of open-ended question is, is, is what that system of social organization um, that looms out on the horizon is ultimately going to look like? We have some sort of fascinating um, 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 uh, 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 insights that we can focus on, but it's not really clear how this is all going to cohere together um, mm -hmm. as consumption and consumerism as the underlying logic of, 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 of contemporary lifestyles um, continues to, um, to wither. So um, the comments I'm going to make here today, and again, I promise to be, uh, be quite brief, is to look at the handloom um, and the description, very evocative descriptions that we've just heard, um, as a metaphor of sorts for a post-industrial, post-consumer mode of provisioning that I think has relevance not only in India um, or Afghanistan, but perhaps has some lessons for those of us even in cities like New York. So let's, uh, this may be familiar to most of you, but let's sort of take a sort of a, a brief tour through the history of development studies or development economics. Going back to the 1950s and the 1960s, some of you may be familiar with Walt Rostow, who was an MIT economist during the 1950s, served as a presidential advisor to Lyndon Johnson, to Dwight Eisenhower, and one of Rostow's important contributions was an economic model called the stage theory of economic growth that has underpinned development thinking, modernization thinking, um, how to bring so-called developing countries along an arc towards, uh, towards modernization. And um, I don't need to go through all of the stages. Again, you're sort of either, you're probably intuitively familiar with this, but the, the point of, of Rostow's model is that traditional or pre-modern societies, through the intervention of strategic investments in ports and roads and airports, um, could be led through this sequence of phases to the ultimate point of development, which to Rostow's mind um, meant um, the emergence of a mass consumer society. Um, 
And um, just very quickly, if we try to sort of formulate a, a very highly stylized um, dichotomy uh, distinguishing the sort of key characteristics between what we, you know, again, in very broad form might think as the main differences between developed and developed countries. Um, I'm going to read it off the screen here because the image on my computer is a little bit small. I'm going to pop around over here. So if we look at a couple of different criteria, industrial scale, a conventional developed country is large scale, preferably led by multinational corporations or mm -hmm. nationalized industries. A conventional developing country is based on artisanal or much more modest scale production. The system of production in a developed country is quote unquote rational and formalized, and by comparison in a developing country is, extended, is characterized by extensive economic informality, at least in the conventional sense. System of consumption, high domestic consumption, typically facilitated by artificial stimulation of needs through the use of ubiquitous advertising and public product promotion. Uh, developing country, modest domestic consumption, based primarily on the satisfaction of basic needs. Uh, role of finance, highly leveraged by commercial debt in comparison to small-scale borrowing, oftentimes provided by interfamilial or, uh, or community basis. And finally, oh, thank you. I'm almost done with this. But, uh, but finally, if we look at the very important notion of economic growth, uh, in a developed country, economic growth is, uh, uh, our, our, our developed country is strongly organized around a rational, uh, kind of rationale of growth, whereas in a developing country, the emphasis is much more so on a steady state premise on meeting basic needs. Oh, finally, oh, this is important too. Uh, last point is, is energy technology. And so as, uh, as we heard in the, uh, in the, in the presentation, uh, a, a, a uh, um, juxtaposition in, in between fossil fuel or nuclear reliance in a, in a developed country, human, animal power, and renewable resources in a um, developing country. And again, um, I, I, I use the sort of the, 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 the characterization or the, the demarcation of developed and developing countries in a very um, sort of standardized sense. OK, so as to sort of return back to some of the earlier themes I started out with, as the middle class in develop, developed countries contracts in both absolute and globally proportional terms. What we're seeing, I would argue, is the distinctions between middle-income developed countries like India, China, Brazil, uh, and developed countries are becoming less obvious. So let me just quote one sentence from the paper that we just heard, and it comes up towards the end of the manuscript where um, it said that, uh, meanwhile, malnutrition, particularly in the countryside, is worsening as jobs dry up, real wages fall, and food prices rise. So that was a sentence that was written about India, but lifted out of its context could just as readily describe conditions that we see in present day America. So the point. The larger point here is that we're seeing on a macroeconomic and macro social scale a kind of convergence taking place between the global north and at least some parts of the global south. And just to point to, in very, very broad form to some of those similarities, we see as we've heard in the case of India, um, atmospheric levels of economic income inequality, the emergence of a less formalized economy in countries like the United States, what has euphemistically come to be characterized as the sharing economy, is really about the emergence of a gig economy or the increasing centrality of contingent labor. 
And perhaps a little bit more positively, we also see in countries like the United States of growing interest in craft production, reskilling, or what, um, uh, what long time ago um, was referred to as prosumption, a concept that's been taken up by the sociologist George Ritzer um, and has come, come to characterize a lot of the emergent work on this idea of post-consumerism. Over the last couple of months, I've also been involved in organizing a colloquium series um, at a think tank in Boston called the TELUS Institute that I maintain an affiliation with um, on the, the theme of post-work, post-consumerist futures. Um, and this was a topic that got a lot, of, a lot of attention in the United States and Europe during the 1990s, during an earlier wave of deindustrialization, Some of you may be familiar with books like Jeremy Rifkin's The End of Work. Uh, another example is a, a book by Stanley um, Aronowitz called The Jobless Future. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of attention around these, uh, this, this mode of thinking uh, 20 or so years ago. Um, with the rise of the internet and information-based economies, um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of that interest faded away. Um, but in the meantime, what we've seen in countries like the United States is steadily declining labor force participation. Um, if we dig a little bit deeper into that trend, we find that. Um, the picture's a little bit more complicated. Over the last 30 or 40 years, we've seen um, growing labor force participation in the United States on the part of women. Um, but what that masks is just the precipitous drop in labor force participation that has occurred among men. And obviously, we've heard quite a bit about that in the months since the November election. So at the present moment, we see new waves of technological unemployment, or the prospect of technological unemployment, uh, being driven by innovations in artificial intelligence, robotics, um, and that's leading to some social movement activity. Some are probably familiar with calls that have rung out in recent months about the establishment of a universal basic income or broad-based stockholder ownership, or various means in order to sort of spread the wealth uh, created by increasing um, robotization and, uh, and, and automation. Um, at the same time, we take a look at a country like India, and we also see a long-standing chronic insufficiency in formal wage-based employment. I myself have been attracted over the last uh, six or 12 months to a growing body of literature that's come to be referred to as work, as, as research on the idea of a post-work future. Here's a couple of, uh, of, of, of prominent um, examples for anybody who is, is interested, but, but what sort of emerges out of that are a couple of different scenarios. Um, one, and this may be the sort of business as usual scenario, is that we are heading towards a kind of neo-feudalism, or what some have characterized as, as re-peasantization. That a few decades from now, we may look back on the industrial era as having been a fascinating, unique moment in human history, in economic history, where relatively uneducated um, uh, individuals were able to earn a quite substantial living building cars, building refrigerators, building air conditioners, uh, simply by walking out of the high school that they graduated from or maybe not graduated from, walking across the street to an industrial plant, that, that, that those sorts of economic circumstances are, are fading away. Um, and obviously, we're left with a profound political challenge of how we, we manage that process of, 
of, of, of economic change and economic transition. There's also a possibility, at least, of a more optimistic outcome emerging out of this. Um, and it's a, it's a scenario that has been kind of lying latent for several decades and was originally articulated uh, famously um, by John Maynard Keynes uh, in an essay that he wrote in 1930 um, entitled Economic Possibilities of My Grandchildren, where he wrote in part that technological unemployment means in the long run that mankind is solving its economic problem. Thus, for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure, to live wisely and agreeably and well. So just wrapping up here is if we take Keynes's observations from 1930 and try to bring them into the sort of contemporary moment, I think what Keynes was trying to envision or articulate was how do we design the preconditions of sustainable livelihoods? And that the vision that was articulated in the paper that we've just heard I think places hand production, craft production, hand loom weaving at the center of how we go about the process of creating, of designing opportunities for a more sustainable future. So thank you very much for a wonderful paper. And I turn the discussion over to the rest of the group. Okay, if we could have the um, microphone down in the middle, and if you'd like to start lining up, we'll take um, some minutes oh, for no. questions um, nice. uh, before we break for <laughs> lunch. Um, so thank you for bringing the microphone down. And given the number of people already in the line, please keep your questions short. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Zorana Ma'am, for this enlightening uh, talk that you gave. Uh, it just calls to mind one of these instances when I was visiting uh, one of the handloom societies in uh, north of Kerala, in Kannur. And this was one of the, uh, this basically we could uh, sort of try and note their concerns down and write an email and uh, to, the, to the board of directors to NIFT and say that you, know, you should need to inquire into this. But what I really was wondering, and I was uh, hoping that you would help me understand as to how uh, textile designers, young budding textile designers in India could really factor in uh, this process of getting with the weavers' products out into the urban markets and fetch them higher revenues for their, you know, skills or crafts, or in fact, even f like beginning from the basics of how can they uh, use these machines and, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, um, uh, I'm delighted to hear that you're interested in improving the weavers' lot. Um, 
I would suggest that uh, a long apprenticeship uh, with hand weavers to learn what it is that they really want. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always the best thing uh, to have a designer coming in from outside and uh, immediately setting about doing what he and she thinks is right. So um, when we started working, it was a very long apprenticeship, Anupurna mm -hmm. will tell you. And I would suggest the same. OK, thank you. That's one of the areas that Annapurna mentioned in terms of, I mean, design can be, it can be a realm of appropriation also of Weaver's work. Thank you. Um, the conference is about weaving and cognition, and I very much enjoyed your talk. And what I'd like to do is actually um, put another point of cognition in another field in which you specialize, and that's as a goldsmith, and that you're from India, um, I believe. Um, so India has the largest ownership of gold per capita as far as person than anywhere else in the world. And it's very much of a tradition, correct me if I'm wrong, of when someone gets married, the gifts are, are of gold. Someone is born, uh, there's uh, gifts of gold ex uh, exchanged. And when you sell the woven goods and would pay taxes in the past, long ago, you'd actually give a portion of what you produced, not currency, fiat currency by the government. And your government just recently outlawed 500 uh, rupee and 1,000 rupee notes. And I'm kind of curious as to how you see in this playing out with the connection of the medium of exchange with the product that's actually being produced. And if someone else is actually controlling that medium of exchange, are they not controlling what you produce? And I'm kind of curious, what are the conversations that are going on in India right now around that realm? Yeah, I, I really think that uh, question is too big uh, to be answered uh, uh, it, uh, from in this short time, and I'm not sure that I'm the right person to answer it, because you know, it's taking in uh, demonetization and India's propensity for collecting gold, it really doesn't have much to do with goldsmithing. Um, because it's <laughs> the uh, gold itself that uh, people value and they hold on to as, as what they think of as a secure uh, investment. And um, demonetization is a huge uh, topic which I really don't think I'm uh, c competent to talk about. Maybe Maury can, no? <laughs> Next question. Um, hi, and thank you so much. So just to preface my question, I'm going to say I have post-concussive syndrome, and for you in, in cognition and neuroscience, you know what that means about getting everything out correctly, so I wrote this down. So I come at this from um, a social justice and civic society lens, and also as an artist and designer. Um, and so I'm not an economist. Sorry. Not, I'm not an economist and um, I'm not a neuroscientist or expert in technology, but from a purely human perspective, it's clear that this makes ultimate sense, that the cloth that we wear on our bodies, the cloth that we sit on or use every day, needs to be connected to the earth in some way, and that the people who create this cloth mean something and matter. And so I'm wondering, though, how do you get to the shift from hierarchy to democracy when the costs of the products themselves of hand weaving um, are run, and when they're run by fair practices, require only people of higher economic status to purchase these goods. And then the others then end up purchasing the mass-produced goods. And I think part of it, and I wonder what your take on it, is um, that Maury's error right there, not just consumed differently but less, is something that is not understood by the young people or even really anyone in this society anymore. So how do we truly create a democratic system? Well, I'm glad you said that. And uh, it um, was purely an oversight on my part not to draw more explicit attention to the, to the notion of sufficiency, uh, which is the um, sort of elephant in the room in all discussions about sustainability, particularly in relatively affluent countries like the United States. Um, so the sort of throwaway line that I oftentimes um, 
uh, use in these kinds of situations, and particularly with my students, is to talk about sustainability as being a two-sided coin. One side is efficiency, uh, but we're certainly never going to move towards, successfully move towards a more sustainable future on the basis of ever-increasing improvements of efficiency because efficient, there's a long ago theorem developed by a 19th century British economist called William Stanley Je Jevons that we know of today as the Jevons paradox um, teaches us that improvements of efficiency, in improvements in efficiency simply lead to increased um, aggregate, uh, aggregate output. Um, it's one of the reasons why as, as steam engines during the 19th century got more and more efficient, um, British industry used more rather than less coal. Um, uh, and uh, it's also the reason why if we, you know, devote all of our time and attention to building energy efficient homes and thermo insulating our, our households, um, um, it's, it's, it's simply saving us money <laughs> that then needs to be reallocated. But that's the other, the other side of the coin is, is sufficiency. And part of the problem that we have in contemporary American culture is articulating an effective political argument for not just consuming less, which we might think of as kind of the, the, the myth of green consumerism, but, and, and, and not just consuming differently, but, but how do we consume um, less and, and create opportunities for lifestyles that are predicated on substantial reductions in energy and material throughput. So thank you for drawing, giving me the opportunity to, to draw attention to that point. Next question, please. Let's collect two questions I think that we'll answer together. Well, thank you very much for your focus on weaving and um, sustainable futures. Uh, my question is for Uzrama, and I, I responded to your comment on fake handloom cloth. So I was wondering if you could define it a little bit further for me, who is a weaver and an industrial designer. Um, are you referring to entirely mill-made cloth or to cloth that's made on mechanical looms that aren't traditional hand looms like the Hattersley loom uh, because other industries like the um, Harris Tweed industry in, in Britain, in Scotland, um, has been made possible. The revival of that particular hand tradition is made possible by a, an automatic non-power loom. So I'm wondering if the weaving technology itself is changing in your effort to increase the awareness and production of the hand weavers. Okay, hold that thought. Okay, sorry. And could we take the next question? We just need to collect them so that we can move on. Um, my faster. question is about fossil fuels and sustainability. Um, specifically, I'm wondering how India might avoid um, what happened in the United States in the 50s and 60s where cotton production moved to using nitrogen, um, fertilizers, um, tractors, and then crop dusters um, to defoliate so that it can be picked. And I, I'm wondering, is there an inevitability that that will happen in India or not? Uh, right. Um, uh, in answer to the first question, there's always uh, a lot of innovation among handloom weaving, as Annapurna will tell you, uh, in the technology itself. I mean, they use uh, uh, different kinds of pickup motion, for example, or they introduce slightly uh, different designs which uh, were not there before, which are made on slightly mechanized, uh, uh, not mechanized, but uh, operated by hand, but different uh, technologies that produce a different kind of cloth. That is the kind of, uh, the kind of changes which happen within the handloom industry. We don't have uh, the Hattersley loom, as you say. What I'm referring to is the cloth that is made to imitate handloom. Uh, as I said, there's a Handloom Reservation Act. So all bordered fabrics are reserved to be made by the handloom, and this is a law. Like a uh, biscuit company has a right to its brand. Uh, but what happens is that that law is flouted, and the power looms, which are unregulated looms, they don't have labor laws as you heard in that story I told about this young weaver who went to Surat. Uh, these looms operate outside the legal uh, structures of labor laws. And uh, they are on a smaller scale to escape many of those factory provisions. And uh, it's entirely illegal in one sense. And 
uh, this is the kind of cloth that is undercutting the handloom because they imitate uh, the handloom, handloom fabrics in the market at a much cheaper price. And then in, in response to the second question about fossil fuels and, sus and sustainability, which is a good time to mention bailing also. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, can you tell me the question again? What is uh, that? Yes, uh, he asked uh, oh, is it inevitable? to talk, sorry, for the yes, farming. is it inevitable for the farmers to well, use Well, you um, know, uh, I, I don't think it's uh, inevitable, certainly, uh, for the next hundred years, I would say, because all our farmers are very small scale. Unlike the way cotton is grown in America, which is on very large farms, which allow that kind of mechanization, you know, the mechanized picking and the uh, crop dusting and so on, and uh, that is only possible in these very large tracts. If you see the photographs on the internet of American cotton farms, they are huge. And they employ these huge machines for mechanical picking and uh, mechanized uh, crop dusting and so on. We have very small uh, uh, holdings uh, growing the cotton. And uh, those uh, mechan mechanizations are not really suitable for the Indian way of growing. So I don't see that is going to go in that direction. Well, I'll just say briefly that, uh, that even in the United States, the uh, advent of, uh, of a fossil fuel economy or an ubiquitous fossil fuel economy, crop dusting, nitrogen fertilizers, and so forth, is, is no, by no means inevitable. Um, it's not a didn't unfold as uh, some sort of law of physics. I mean, it unfolded because of uh, public policy that were put in place in order to favor one alternative over another. And uh, perhaps you know that uh, American cotton growing, which is mostly done by big corporations, is subsidized by the US government. Uh, they have uh, huge subsidies of, I think it's something like 104%. And that's what depresses the prices of Indian cotton and of smaller countries like Mali, whose uh, economy is entirely dependent on cotton. Please. Thank you both for actually beautifully laying out the operational inefficiencies in the whole process. My question to you, ma'am, is uh, what, how do you envision a future, um, say 50 years down the lane, what is your vision for the future? Um, how does it look like? And my question for you, sir, um, is that um, this aspect of sustainable consumption and production requires also a behavioral change from everybody. Um, I'm just wondering to ask, where does that behavioral change start off from, and how, does, how do you think it should begin? Well, um, there are uh, two possible directions for the future. One is a good possibility, and one is a bad possibility. And so I don't really know which way it's going to happen, but uh, uh, I think my whole, uh, the work that uh, the Malka organization does is in order to promote handloom weaving as a source of making cloth for the future. Well, there's sort of two different schools of thought within the field of sustainable consumption research and practice. Um, one, um, we might think of generally as, as weak sustainable consumption suggests that um, through uh, kind of behavioral economics and uh, nudging consumers in the right direction and providing information at uh, points of purchase and advertising, um, um, consumer education broadly construed, you know, will we'll kind of bend the arc slowly. Um, I myself am not particularly confident that that offers the pathway of, uh, of uh, preferred choice and alternative to that is what we might characterize as strong sustainable consumption, um, which um, suggests in a biophysically constrained world, uh, one that is inexorably warming as a result of climate change, um, we will need to see much more effective policy action by governments um, at all different scales, um, rebuilding uh, provisioning systems um, that are based on very different rationales than most of us are, are, are familiar. Um, and, a, an old, and, and, and one um, um, uh, sort of alternative of that pathway, one that uh, I certainly wouldn't suggest is one that you know, will be driven by crisis. Um, which, um, you know, may end up being the one that ends up playing out. Last question, really quick. 
Uh, I think it's important for us to engage a little bit more directly in the issues of power here. Two brief examples. One, a friend of mine uh, from India who did her dissertation on the attempts of Indian cotton growers to maintain local varieties in the face of companies like Monsanto who were willing not only to sell them the package that indebted them, but also to bring lawsuits against them because their crops were inadvertently um, cross-pollinating uh, and therefore, uh, you know, to have characterizing their own crops as theft. Second, what we see in this country as a result of the uh, lowering demand for labor has been, in fact, the, uh, the gig economy, which lowers people's income radically so that the enjoyment of our leisure time is not Keynesian in the least. Ms. Rama, do you want to start? Well, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean. Uh, Monsanto is forcing Indian farmers to buy its seed. And uh, the tests that are carried out by the state-constituted committee are actually uh, have a representative of, of Monsanto on it. So uh, it's very difficult to uh, separate the state and uh, the uh, uh, corporate industry. They work so well together. But we do have very active movements working against it, and um, it's but it's it's a very difficult situation. So the freeing up of labor as the result of increasing automation automation um, uh, doesn't inevitably have to lead towards a kind of neoliberal gig economy. Um, as we see, for the most part, um, um, emerging in the United States. Um, we look at experiences taking place in countries like Finland, where there's an ongoing experiment to implement a broad-based uh, universal basic income um, as, uh, as part of more positive cases. Uh, the whole general idea of a universal basic income is a see receiving attention from countries as, uh, as disparate as Finland to Kenya. Um, and um, maybe for somewhat more perverse reasons, you even find experiments uh, emerging out of Silicon Valley um, to the extent that we embrace a technologically deterministic future. Um, maybe there's some lessons to learn from the folks out in Silicon Valley who may be able to see a little bit over, a little bit further over the parapet into the future than, 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 than those of us here. Um, but again, to sort of return back to the point that I made before, these are explicit public policy decisions that we have within our power to make. Um, and, um, and so, well, I'll stop there given the time. So that <laughs> paradox of explicit public policy decisions and um, government regulation or government implication in, uh, with corporations uh, will be discussed further in the uh, uh, discussion period this afternoon, so please come back for that. We're going to break now for lunch. Um, please come back at 2. We'll start a little bit after 2 um, for our afternoon session, and then we'll begin the discussion se session around 4.15. Um, I just want to mention before we thank our speakers that the um, the, a brochure explaining more about the way that Malka works is at the back table, so please pick one up. And there's also a um, swatch book of um, samples from Malka cotton, unbaled cotton, which, as you will notice from Uzrama's beautiful sari, takes color, takes dye really <laughs> intense, intensely. So it's um, it's uh, something really different and special. Please pick those up. Um, and now, please, before we break for lunch, um, thank both of our speakers for this really enlightening and inspiring session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.